Okay. So uh, I guess that's my cue. So I want to thank <laughs> everyone for uh, <laughs> uh, for the interest and uh, thank the designers for, uh, or, you know, in this case, John, John LaRue and his team for putting together a, a great proposal. We've got uh, three uh, appear to be very well qualified designers and uh, uh, we're here to uh, hear their presentations and uh, ultimately make a selection of who we think is going to be the best fit. Uh, so today we've got John LaRue. He's going to be presenting a sample playground design uh, that we're going to use to help determine the best designer for our playground. Uh, note that the design is being presented today is only being used to assist with choosing the best designer. Uh, once the designer is chosen, we will use the design presented today as a starting point or draft and fine tune the actual design with additional comments we receive from the public and uh, town and school staff uh, in the coming weeks. So once the presentation is done, we'll have about 30 minutes for a Q&A. And if people have any comments or suggestions that you'd like to submit uh, with the designer uh, selection working group, you could email Mike McCarron, the town clerk, or Wayne Amaral, the DPW director, uh, on or before May 28th. And uh, that's all posted to the uh, homepage of the town website with their emails and phone numbers. Uh, so with that, uh, John, we'll turn it over to you and that your slides are preloaded on Wayne's workstation. So you just give him the cue and he'll advance to the next slide. Yeah, I think I'm going to be advancing the slides, Wayne and I. Oh, I'm okay, that, great. So I'm a little more high tech. Anyway, okay. yes, yeah, so, um, John LaRue, the name of my company is Big Toys. I live down here in Rhode Island. This is a little bit of a before shot. And uh, you work with big toys, that's what you look afterwards. Um, I'm going to go over all of this equipment for you in the layout. But essentially what we've got going right here in the middle is going to be uh, the older kids section. We've got a younger kids section. we got a new set of swings in the back. Over on this side, you've got your existing swings. You've got actually two sets of swings over there. Um, one of them's got to come out because it uh, doesn't meet the codes, but one's going to stay. And then we've got um, what we call our Gaga pit over here, which is uh, hysterical. Love the Gaga pit. Um, so the, I'll uh, going to show you exactly what the what it is that we uh, we intend on doing here for you. Um, a little bit about me. One thing to know is that I'm not a marketing professional. I mean, I I just work in the. I'm a one man team here. Uh, President, vice president, secretary, treasurer, I do it all, one person op operation. But um, I mean, my background is therapeutic recreation. Um, I've been doing playgrounds for 30 years. This is year 32 for me. But down here in Rhode Island, we stumbled on Rhode Island in 1991. Um, the American Society for Landscape Architects, I was the first continuing education provider in the playground equipment industry in the world that. Uh, uh, gives uh, continuing education credits to uh, architects since 1999, actually. Um, my background is therapeutic recreation. I was involved with the creation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I worked on that in 1988 and 1989 before it even became to fruition in 1990. I was part of the group, three-person team that put together the ADA design guide. And I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. All sorts of certifications. I've got all sorts of um, tools and gadgets. I do a lot of uh, third-party certifications for accessibility and um, safety compliance for everybody's equipment across the, the Northeast part of the country here. I'm involved in a lot of the regulatory groups. Um, Big Toys is a very traditional look. And the thing about Big Toys too, is we've got the highest percentage of recycled product in the industry anywhere. Nobody can hold a match to a candle to, to our percentages. Um, safety and accessibility go hand in hand, all of the different regulatory groups. I'm gonna tell you about those in a little bit. And we're gonna be posing a, a, what we call a hybrid system here, um, engineered wood fiber and rubber matting for your surfacing. So the point I wanna make here is again, I'm not just a marketing person. We do it all right here out of my office. I control the whole, um, uh, the whole gamut. This right here is uh, what the overall plan is going to be looking like. This area right over here is the new area. It's roughly uh, 92 by 82. And again, school age, early childhood, set of swings. 
Uh, on the original plan and proposal we submitted, I do want to know that this little year right here in red, the activity playoffs, that was removed just because we had to hit a couple of budget items, uh, but we left it in the plan for perhaps um, in the future. Um, your existing swings, your Gaga pit, this right here happens to be the pathway that's existing. This area right here is raised from this area. A um, little bit of an elevation change, but the whole concept here is a main play area, refurbishing swings, doing the Gaga pit and having our ADA access pathways. You can see right in here, this little green line, this right here, the next slide is gonna show it a little clearer, but this little green right here is gonna show you the hybrid surfacing. This is all gonna be a unitary product. This in here is going to be uh, an engineered wood fiber product. I like using a, uh, the hybrid system for two reasons. Number one, the cost. Foreign place rubber matting is ridiculously expensive. Rubber matting costs more than the equipment and it only lasts 10 years. Um, the other is heat. Um, on a day, you go out on a day like today when it's like 82, 83, 82, I don't know where it is up there with you guys. It's, we're down here in the 80s today. Um, but you get a day when it's uh, 90 degrees outside and sunny, the rubber matting is gonna heat up to 150, 160 degrees pretty easily. So I like to try to do a little bit of a hybrid. This um, sheet that we gave to you here in our, uh, our, um, our proposal up here at the top, we talked about the um, plate components right up in here. Total plate components that we're presenting to you folks here is 52 um, total different things to do in this playground. 19 of them are elevated, 33 are ground. And we got to deal with ADA so we've got requirements on percentages. There's um, five components that are accessible via a ramping system. That's gonna be right down through here, five to five. We're required to have none, but there are five. Uh, we have uh, 16 elevated um, components on what we call an accessible route of travel through transfer stations. I'll show you that in a second. We're required to have 10. Um, we have 33 ground level play activities on this unit. We're required to six. I'm very focused on ground level play, um, different types of play components. Um, and we're gonna go over those play types in a few minutes. Uh, we have seven, we're required to have three. So we're very, very integrated here, very accessible um, uh, through ground level and um, uh, elevated components for the ADA rights. This is what it looks like on your existing thumbprint. You can see a little bit of the darker brown here. This is your existing wood chips. So we're just kind of going right over what you have right now. Uh, some rubber over here, wood chips here. And again, here's that pathway going over to your Gaga pit. So the thumbprint pretty much stays the same. So we're not having to go above and beyond uh, to do anything different, differently. We propose around 8,200, yeah, about 8,200 square feet of uh, wood fiber, around uh, or 6,200 square feet of wood fiber, around 3,600 square feet of rubber matting is here. In the proposal we submitted, we actually pared that down to about 2,800 just to hit your budget. And that's just because we took the rubber out of here and we took the rubber out of here, or we could just reduce a little bit of the rubber here. But again, we were price pointed. But overall, we're talking just under um, 10,000 square feet of play area, which is huge. Um, starting out with uh, the Gaga pit, um, they, you folks wanted a Gaga, uh, a Gaga pit. And we there's a lot of knockoffs out there. Most playground companies have their own Gaga pit system. We work with, I work with Coach Cliff. He's the guy that created Gaga Cliff, uh, the Gaga pit. We take a look at this unit right here either a six side or eight side, you can see the easy in and the easy out. And I'll point this one down here, which is a, a composite. You can see this has just got an easy in, easy out. That doesn't fly with me. Um, we put on doors. This right here is a door to provide for ADA access. You're gonna do a Gaga pit, you wanna do a knockoff, don't do just this. Get a door on it to be ADA compliant. Um, there's all sorts of things you can do with it. You can buy just the frames, these things right here, and you can buy your own lumber, or you can buy composite lumber, or you can buy natural wood. 
we have um, tops that go on the tops of the wood here. So it's a little, a little user friendly for the, for the hand. So our Gaga pits are the actual Gaga pit, not a knockoff. Um, in our swing area here, or the play area here, again, your existing swing stay as is. This is a lower elevation going up to the upper elevation. That's an existing pathway. I would advocate that you put in a new pathway to the system because the kids are gonna go from the building, which is right here, straight to the playground. They're not gonna walk around that way. So you might wanna put a new pathway in there because that's just how kids are. But again, we've got our uh, school age, early childhood and our swings. And we'll talk a little bit about early childhood. Um, there's a little bit of a climbing here. This was the activity playhouse unit that, uh, uh, would be a future phase because again we took it out because of budget wobbly tunnels we got some plate panels manipulatives auditory um, components as well uh, so that's a little bit of a section this right here talks a little bit shows a little bit more of the swings couple of belts a couple of special needs swings close up of the early childhood climber again some suggestions for some manipulatives auditory um, um, and visual feedback manip manipulatives all within the ADA reach range advisories. This whole unit right here is equipped with a what they call a transfer station. I'll show you the transfer station in a few minutes, but this entire unit right here for ages two to five um, uh, is in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the other thing to keep note on, even though this is a two to five unit, physically, all ages can use it. And you're gonna have your kindergartners and your first graders all over this too if they want. Depends how much uh, limit setting. But you're not gonna do any limit setting in the evenings after hours in the summer. But just know that the older kids get on it, they're not gonna break it at all. It's not very interesting for an eight or nine year old, but they're not gonna break it. The um, combination uh, classic um, structure here, does come with a shade unit right here. This is roughly 25 by 25, supported by four posts that are part of the structure of the uh, um, uh, structural component of the big toy. Uh, we have an overhead ladder right here. Now we can lower this overhead ladder to 54 inches if you want. 54 inches is the recommended maximum height for wheelchair users. If you lower it to 54 inches, you will have kids climbing on top of it. Now the surfacing is going to prevent the uh, fall height, you know, the fall protection on here. But you understand if you lower it at 54 inches, kids will be on top of that. Um, so I might tend to keep it up a little bit higher, take the lower turn chin bars and keep them a little bit lower. But that's a choice and that's a decision we can make that in there. Um, that's also a decision we can make a year after it's built, because this is very modular. The idea here is to complete the loop. Um, and we do this by easy access transfer. All of the designs that you, you look at, make sure that they make sense for completing the loop. And what I mean by that is simple. Let's say we have a wheelchair user to come here to transfer out onto a transfer station platform. And they go up these triangular steps, no more than an eight inch change in elevation, snake all the way around, up to the deck, down the slide, wheelchairs right here makes it very very simple and you don't want to have the transfer station for example over here i've seen some designs many designs where you got to go you know 100 feet 150 feet to go get your wheelchair so we try to put our transfer stations very close to some of the key activities and the whole focus here is completing the loop again we've got a wheelchair transfer system up here going to a manipulative panel, manipulative panel, a bubble panel. And then we have access over here to this thing called the Turner Cross, which I'll show you in a minute, which is a riot. Um, we have a lot of little places underneath the um, structures. Um, we really enjoy, I, I like putting these little seats in there. They're, they're called hammocks, but they don't move. They're, they're plastic um, form. They're like a U shape, uh, but it's a, a very, common place for the kids to hang out, quiet space, out of the direct sun for sure um, as well. And over here is the turn across. And this is probably the most integrated piece of playground equipment in the playground industry. I love this thing. 
Um, you uh, crank the windlass right here. When you do that, the gondola goes back and forth on the trolley. Uh, wheelchair transfer height, wheelchair transfer height, wheelchair transfer height, ground to step um, uh, platform as well. You go up with a, a wheelchair, you're gonna stop right there. You see these little U joints, these little U bars. We do not want a wheelchair out there. Fall off the deck. We have, we're governed by safety, we're governed by accessibility. The two go hand in hand, safety trumps um safety trumps accessibility each and every time so we're not going to have a wheelchair um out here on this platform but this unit right here is all wheelchair friendly uh, mobility device friendly uh the swings that we uh, the new swings uh four belts over here and then we've got um, our some of our special needs molded seats over here uh i think we put one in that was um, um ages five to twelve we put another one in that was ages two to twelve uh, there's a couple of different types to do uh, for special needs seats. And you can see, again, we're doing rubber matting right through here. Here's the early childhood station. And this actually is a good view of the transfer station right here for the early childhood unit. So again, this whole section right through here is geared ages two to five. Anybody can do it. Um, these tunnels, as a matter of fact, are a two to five, five to 12 unit um, age group. But we're uh, we're doing six total swings, and um, we can we can mix and match if you wanted to. We could take to put a belt here, put a special needs seat over here if you wanted in the in the uh, in the wood fiber area. Regulatory groups pointless. Um, I'm on a lot of these standard committees, and I'm a real strong advocate for the consumer. But there is this thing called the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Handbook for Public Playground Safety, which you have to adhere to. And this right here is the Guide to ADA Accessibility for uh, Plug Play Areas. And this is this document that's published by the Department of Justice. I was part of the three-person team that conceived this document um, back in uh, the very early 90s. Accessibility versus integration. First of all, there's barriers. Nothing is barrier free. That's because we are not designing a playground for one specific user. We've got all sorts of users to consider. Mobility impairments, sensory impairments, developmental, um, developmental abilities. We're dealing with social skills and children on the spectrum with autism, strength training, agility training, conflict resolution opportunities here um, for, um, uh, for, for children to, who, are, who are dealing with a, a character and behavior issues. So we're dealing with an awful lot of things on a play area. It is impossible to design a play area for 100% of the kids to use 100% of the activities. You simply can't because the ability levels and the interest levels vary so much. Um, but we do want to design for all children so they have some choices. And anybody out there who might be an early childhood education advocate may understand or have, be aware of uh, Jean-Claude Piaget, which is the, uh, uh, he's simply the grandfather of what kids do, what makes a kid's tick, uh, what makes a kid tick. And we have to come up with this document called play types. Now, again, we were charged with this um, task of putting together this design guide for the ADA standards. And one of the things that the Department of Justice threw at us was they said, well, we want you to put in play types. So we said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You know, we're talking about transfer stations and handholds and, and ramps. But they said, no, we need our play areas to be also developmentally interesting. For example, if we have a, um, a structure that has, you know, 12 different elevated components, we're going to need um, four ground elements. So there's there's percentages that we have to adhere to. The one thing the ADA, the Department of Justice says, well, if you need four ground, we don't want you putting in four ground types, four, four, four spring toys. We want to mix and match and come up with a variety of play types. So play things that um, um, balance, things that swing, things that slide. And so we have, uh, we put together this document here, 
which is our plant play, plant play type document. Um, and this is used around the world, actually. And you can use this if you don't use me, use this document, please. If your playground has, you know, a bulk of these, a good number of these types, um, you're going to be focused on integration and you're going to be focused not so much on accessibility, but you're going to be focused on integration and inclusion when you hit the play types. Accessibility is nothing more than the ramping or the, the how the preparation of the wood fiber is done or the amount of rubber matting and the pathways, uh, the sidewalks to the school. That's the accessibility. The fun portion and the inclusionary portion is when you focus on Piaget and the play types. So we wanna make sure that we have as many of these play types as will fit the space, as this will fit the, um, the interests of your committee. I think we had seven or eight different play types on yours, um, but that's where you sit down with a group and you come up with uh, additional play types. But I'm very focused on making sure that things are developmentally sound. During the design process, we have to make sure that the uh, equipment does meet all of the um, um, standards. Uh, this is uh, the IPEMA, the International Playground Equipment uh, Manufacturers Association. This is a third party group that verifies the safety standards have been met. So you wanna have an IPEMA certificate. Um, I think you're dealing with play all the landscape structures. Um, so be rest assured, those folks are also gonna carry the IPEMA certificate. They're very bona fide companies. Uh, we got a very link, uh, very detailed, lengthy warranty. It's a three-page warranty, actually. It's pretty detailed, but essentially 50 years on the decks, 50 years on the um, uprights. And one thing to make note of: we don't have a wear and tear exclusion on our platforms. Anybody that has the plastisol coated or the PB coated decks will have a wear and tear exclusion. Go look at the platforms don't have that on a uh, big toys at all. And it's 50 years is plenty. Um, overall budgeting, uh, we came in around $185,000 through the uh, national contract purchasing. That was for the early childhood climber, the school age climber swings. And again, one set stays as is. So it was only one set of new swings, some freestanding panels, a few wear mats. It came in around 165 grand uh, the, um, through uh, uh, ProBuild uh, Construction, who's my partner, uh, installation, uh, it included the bid bond, it's at prevailing wage rates. It includes the Gaga pit and the ADA doorway. We get to uh, play around with the design with you a little bit. Don't know if you want six-sided, eight-sided, wood, recycled. So we got some decisions to make there. Um, we put in a budget analysis, a, a budget allotment for three tables, three benches. And again, this is the hybrid surfacing, uh, about one third rubber, two thirds uh, wood fiber. And in talking with the town, you guys are doing your, your site work, your drainage and uh, uh, the aggregate for the surfacing, stuff like that. Um, so that's uh, what we're looking at for the budget. And um, you want to go take a look at a couple of playgrounds. Somebody want to get in a car and drive out to, up to Haverhill, Mass right now. You'll see us in an absolute disastrous mud pit bath up there because we unearthed a, a stream during the construction that we're doing right now. But this is a, a job. This is what's going to be after. They're up there. Um, this is as of just four or five days ago. This is up in Haverhill. There's a beautiful big toy we built a couple of years back over in, um, in Needham, St. Joseph School. Down here is a very extensive big toy. Uh, this is a boundless big toy. Boundless Playgrounds is a, a system where you have a little bit higher degree of ramping um, to be accessible. Uh, we are actually a, a boundless partner. This is a huge structure we put in down in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. Multiple ramps, multiple platforms. Um, it's about twice what we budgeted for you guys. It's very expensive, but we are a boundless partner. I think I lost you for a second. Okay, there we go. Um, so, I mean, essentially we can take this, turn it into this, and in closing, all I can say is big toys. I mean, we're the original posted platform um, concept developer from 1970. Um, this product is 100% made in the USA. 
and we have the highest approach to environmental stewardship anywhere. Um, so that's really about it for me for um, the end of uh, this particular presentation. And I think what I probably need to do, Wayne, is hit my stop sharing or do I stay on it? Um, you, you, could, you could stay on if you like. If somebody wants to switch over to page, you could switch it over. Well, I can just stop right. share whenever you want, but is there anybody okay. have a question on any of these slides? This is probably the one right um, here. Um, John, can, can I stop at one, please? Yep. Um, regarding the rubber matting, I mean, I guess a lot of us are not sure. We're hearing a bunch of different things, and uh, you were the first one that talked about the heat and how hot the matting is. And obviously, I'm concerned a little bit about that myself. Uh, what other alternatives are there other than engineering wood fiber and wood matting? Is there any other thing that we're missing? Um, th there's really only three viable surfaces out there. Um, one would be the engineered wood fiber that is installed per the IPMA specification for ADA. Um, the other would be the liquid rubber pour in place rubber, okay, or a precast rubber tile. But when you're dealing with um, an area in the design that we have here, um, you know, where there's a lot of curves, very organic, you don't want to do tiles. Mm -hmm. Then the third would be a synthetic turf product. If you go with a synthetic turf product, it will be as hot as rubber, sometimes hotter. And one of the biggest negatives it, with synthetic turf is the buildup of static electricity. And especially if you wanna deal with a, a child or an adult that has a cochlear ear implant because of um, hearing issues, um, auditory issues, if you're using a cheap, inexpensive ear um, um, implant, um, the static electricity will sh uh, short it out. Wow. <laughs> it just does. Wow. Uh, but realistically, synthetic turf, rubber, and wood fiber. Okay, so that's the only three. So, are there playgrounds that you've you, that you've designed and worked on that are all engineered wood fiber and no rubber matting? Are there? Oh, absolutely. Um, you can't do that in uh, Massachusetts any longer. Oh. Okay, you can't do a one hundred percent wood fiber um, surface system in the state of Massachusetts because of the Massachusetts Accessibility okay. Architecture and Accessibility Board. Perfect. However, um, you can do 90% engineered wood fiber, and you would have um, rubber matting pathways to the key elements, to the key transfer station, to uh, the special needs seat, um, mm -hmm. maybe some rubber matting around the perimeter. Um, you could do, we would have to do a design if we were doing a very minimal amount of rubber, and you send it over to the mass AAB and have them look at it. And like, if you send them this design right here, they say, fine, RP, they wouldn't hardly look at it because there's a lot of rubber here. But you cannot do just wood fiber okay. in the state of Massachusetts anymore. Yeah, I, I, I I'm not going that direction. But okay, Tricia. Yeah. yeah, I just, I have a question on this. So my daughter is in a wheelchair. So I'm looking at this yep. as an eye of a parent and somebody who lives with rolling my daughter everywhere. Yep. And, um, I had the opportunity to go visit a playground the other day that had the combination surfacing like you've presented here and there were wood chips all over the pathways. Yep. Um, it was, it was honestly, it, it was a mess. So tell me your thoughts on that and what you anticipate the maintenance program would need to be on the combination surfacing to make sure that it really is accessible because when the wood chips are all over the pathways, it's not accessible anymore. You raise valid points, that's for darn sure. Um, there does have to be some type of a systematic um, approach to you know, clearing the, um, uh, the, the uh, unitary product, the rubber, uh, using a blower, which does have to get blown away. The other is the engineered wood fiber has to be installed correctly and compacted properly. Um, is there maintenance with it? Absolutely. Um, what's the least amount of maintenance? Just, put, just do the whole thing in rubber. If you did the whole thing in rubber there, it's probably $150,000 in rubber. And um, on a day when it's um, 85 degrees and sunny, you're not gonna be on that playground with your kid. It's too hot. 
I mean, it just gets hot. You go in the morning, you have to go late in the afternoon. I mean, that's fine. But in the heat of the day, you just don't. Wood chips have to be periodically swept and maintained on them off the rubber matting. You use a blower. Thank you. I actually have some additional questions. Um, if anybody minds, if I just jump in sure. there, um, just looking at your pictures, you were, you know, you were mentioning the accessibility versus inclusion, and based on the design that I'm looking at, there are a lot of structures and um, ground. I guess you could call them structures that are completely unaccessible to a child who is in a wheelchair or in a walker or gait trainer. Um, just looking at the early childhood section off to the side, it doesn't look like there's any access. It's all on the wood chips. Uh, you're right. Yeah, uh, that's a, uh, an example of how the Massachusetts Accessibility Architecture Board was say A-OK -okay to the design, putting a uh, rubber matting pathway to the transfer station only. Um, they can certainly get involved and can certainly get increased. Uh, we're, we're also budget driven here. Um, okay. If you wanted to do a lot more rubber, you would just be doing a lot less equipment when you're dealing with a budget. Um, the number of ground level activities that we have here, I think it's 33 in this entire playground is a lot. And again, we're trying to deal um, and address the needs of a multitude of individuals, um, not just someone who's in a wheelchair, um, but there are people in walkers, there are people in crutches, there are people with braces, um, there are people with vision impairments um, as well. Um, we do a little bit with the auditory, but, um, but not a great deal of that. It's mostly, um, um, it's, it's, it seems to be mostly focused on the, the wheelchair user, but that's not, it's, it's really not representative of everybody that uses the, of, uh, the play area. So you gotta try to appeal to everybody. So like I said before, uh, there's nothing that's barrier free, nothing. Um, but you get in the design process, uh, we got a gazillion different things to, uh, to look at, to modify, and again, I rely on my approach to Piaget to make sure we hit those ground type, uh, those different play types. Again, John, this is just a draft, but if you, know, oh, if yeah. you are the ch 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 chosen one uh, for, for this, we could be creative on placement of these d d devices that Trish is talking about. Some of those things are, uh, you know, the Southwest corner, C could they be scattered at the edge of the rubber matting so it's still accessible? So, you know, we, can we be creative with that? Would you recommend, you know? Absolutely, no, Ab okay. absolutely. This is just a stab in the dark here. Yep. Um, and I, you know, I, I just tried to encapsulate as much as the climbers I possibly could to keep the folks at the MAAB um, happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but no, we absolutely can move things around. We actually, the original design I had, we had a boatload of ground level activities, a lot more. Mm -hmm. Right up in the top right where it says future expansion, we had a whole bunch of different ground events up there mm -hmm. in the first go around, but we cut them out because of the budget. Um, but no, there's, the, the design capabilities here is all based on the input from the community in which we come and we sit down and we go through the catalogs and mm -hmm. we have and, and that's. That's the design, but are we standing firm on the combination surfacing? I just think from an inclusion and an accessibility point of view, when you have anything that's on a wood chip that one child can't access, regardless of physical abilities or differences, that immediately excludes them. So when I'm looking at this, I see a lot of exclusion. So okay. is this a possibility of looking at this from a different kind of a surfacing. The different of type of surfacing would be to do the whole thing, the rubber matting. The other is to get a little bit more educated on the use and the installation of the engineered wood fiber um, when it's installed correctly. There is an IPEMA certificate certified installation technique for engineered wood fiber for immediate wheelchair access. Um, which this playground would have that. And I think you'd also, if it was um, uh, maintained, it was compacted the way the um, installation specifications require, 
uh, you would not see an awful lot of wood chips floating around. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, so are you saying that a wheel, the way, if it was compacted correctly, a wheelchair would be able to roll over the parts that are 100% wood chips? Unequivocally. Hands down. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, as a mom Hands with down. a daughter with a wheelchair, I can tell you, I have never once been able to get her. It's even difficult to roll a wheelchair over grass if you're in the true wheelchair. Absolutely. Um, I'm one of the very few people in this industry that has a rotational controlometer and I can test any surface on the planet and let you know whether or not it's going to meet the ASTM 1951 standard, which is for wheelchair propulsion on any surface. I own one. I test it all the time. Makes my installers insane when I go back to say, nope, do it again. Let it do it again. <laughs> There's a way to install it. A lot of contractors hate to see me coming afterwards because I come in and say, wait, I'm going to test it. If I can, if it fails, it's going to fail. If it passes, it's going to pass. Um, hey, hey, John, just to in interject briefly. So in addition to the routine maintenance that you described, uh, what's been your experience with the engineered wood fiber of, of is there a, every so often there needs to be any kind of like wholesale recompaction or anything? Yeah, um, what you'd want to do to maintain the accessibility on an annual basis, annual basis, it would have to be topped off, redistributed, and recompacted. Um, and then as far as how much you have to replenish is all based on the drainage. If it drains really, really well, you won't have to replenish as much. But clearly, it's going to have to be um, um, replenished, raked, leveled, and then recompacted. Where we have things like the rubber mats underneath the swing seats, and on this particular drawing here, on the top left, right up there, um, you would take those mats out. You can pack the wood chips, put the mats back down, but minimum once a year. There's a lot of communities, places that do it twice a year. So, um, there's so things with it. So, 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 John, that's why I asked about the 100% wood, wood, wood fiber. I'm, I'm not a fan of it, but I want to be prepared when people ask, you know, why did we go with this hot mat? Why don't we just do 100% wood fiber, engineered wood fiber that's handicapped accessible and wheelchair accessible? And I just want to understand the maintenance challenges with that also, because we really don't have a lot of staff or resources to maintain something. So it's a b b b b balance you're saying of semi-maintenance free rubber, rubber matting to some maintenance involved with the wood engineer wood fiber, correct? You are absolutely correct. And the rubber matting is also gonna need um, a maintenance. You do have to keep that clean. You get debris on it, um, twigs, um, leaves, things of that nature. Um, they get soaked into the um, uh, fibers of the engineered wood fiber. And then at the end of the swings, or the, on, underneath the swings, um, at the end of the slides, where there's heavy impact, you're gonna get wear and tear. Mm. Typically every three or four years, you're gonna to have to patch the rubber. Oh. You will have to patch it. Interesting. So, Does anybody else have any questions? There is maintenance. Yes, John, what's, what's the process of patching the rubber? Uh, you want to try it yourself. Um, doing it outside the fall zone, anybody can do it. Doing it inside the fall zone, you probably don't want to do that unless you get certified by the rubber matting company <laughs> to do the patchwork because there is fall impact attenuation that has to happen. Typically, rubber matting is installed and repaired by a technician who does rubber matting. Anybody can do the engineered wood fiber, anybody. You can do the rubber matting, repair yourself outside of the use zone and not worry about it. See those flat line right here? That's the use zone. Inside here is all resilient. Something happened right here and you wanted to jury rig it yourself, I'd say, go ahead. You want to do something in here? I'd say, well, hold on. And for me, I'd say, all right, go ahead and do it. Call me. I'll come out and I'll chest it with my triax. I'll make sure it's done correctly. 
and it beats the impact attenuation. Um, now, one other thing I didn't really mention and I'd like to real quick is again, I test surfacing all the time. I test rubber matting, synthetic turf and wood chips all the time. There's these magic numbers. If you go over 200 and 1,000, you fail. Rubber matting, good rubber matting, uh, will come in around 150 and 800, pretty good. That same test right over here in the wood chips, I'll come in about 90 and 300. Twice the protection when you come to a fall, engineered wood fiber over rubber matting. Hands down, twice as effective in uh, protecting from the fall. The downside is if the wood chips get kicked away, you don't have any protection. That's the downside. But from a fall height protection, the engineered wood fiber is the best surface going. Actually, the best surface going for fall height protection is um, recycled rubber chrome. Nike does quite a bit of it here. Uh, recycled uh, sneakers. Uh, they'll put that down from rubber, from just chunks. But it's disgusting. Some, you know, some of its tires are um, <laughs> uh, cut up and chopped up. Extremely resilient. But you don't want you don't want that on your playground. <laughs> uh, recycled rubber like that. <laughs> so no, I will really design with the community. Design with um, whatever interest act, interest groups are out there, and I'm a very strong advocate of trying to represent everybody. You just can't design a playground for one particular group. You got to deal with everybody, ultra bird. That's really why I focus on the Piaget approach to play with the ground types. Okay. Any other questions, anybody? So, so, so ballparking this, I'm, I, I don't want to get down to like nuts and bolts on numbers, but I'm, I'm hearing about a thousand or two thousand dollars a year versus materials and maintenance costs to keep it up yearly average. That's about right. Yeah. How much? One to two thousand dollars. Oh, yeah, easily. Uh, you probably got a couple of thousand dollars a year in um, uh, replenishing some wood chips, patching some rubber. Correct. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I was going off of just the wood chips and then I went to 2000 just based off of what I'm hearing by getting a specialist come in to do some patching. I know that's not every year, but it seems like it's two to three more of a yearly average range as uh, we get to the half-life of the, of the device. Well, see, the wood fiber is kind of a constant. Uh, where your prices are going to start going up is the repair of the rubber. Mm -hmm. That will start going up. And by the way, when you repair rubber, so when we do it, um, we do things, uh, we'll put down graphics, like a fish, a turtle, a porpoise, you know, something like that. We try to put down something that's fun uh, to make the patch look like it's supposed to be there. Hmm. But over the course of years, um, that rubber bandage are going to have to get patched. And the length of that rubber is all going to be based on vandalism. It's also going to be based on how well that area drains. Water is an enemy to rubber mm -hmm. matting. Enemy. The thawing and the, um, the shrinking and, and, and melting just raises havoc on it. Engineer wood fiber is a steady, constant number. Rubber matting is going to just start creeping up every year. And it probably you know, 10 to 15 years, easily, you have to replace the rubber, easily, 10 to 15 years. Do you think pull, pull, up all the rub, pull up all the uh, rubber matting and, and replace it all together? 10 to 15 years, you rip out the rubber and redo it. Wow. wow. How long Both? do you think the average process is for a patch versus a... Uh, well, like patching, that really depends. It, it goes with the charge, you know, a few hundred bucks to go patch it. Um, Does it shut the playground down for days? No, 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 no. no. I didn't know if there was a cure time that we yeah, needed. I, uh, for the top EPDM layer for a patch, yeah, 24 hours. Okay. That's all. Uh, if we do a patch at a playground like this, we tell DPW to go out, out there with uh, uh, put some cones around it or something and keep the play area open. If you have to get some caution tape and caution tape off a slide or something. 
you could do something like that. But a patch, no, nah, it's more in a day or two. Okay, thank you. John, this location, as you know, it's at the top of a hill up, up a, from a river and there's a history of some serious wind up there. Is that a shade structure? Is that gonna be, um, you know, stable? I assume so, but just gotta ask. Yep, 85 mile an hour winds, guaranteed. 85. You got a nor'easter, you have to take it down. Take and it down. The, the uh, fabric comes down. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that before. The fabric is uh, windproof, so it's 85 mile an hour, but the fabric does not support snow and ice. So in the uh, late fall, go up and you take it down. Glad, glad I asked. That's uh, Yeah, that's a key detail. Yeah, the shade unit um, do not support snow or ice. So um, it's called a quick release. Uh, there's a couple little connectors, uh, little turnbuckles that uh, get cranked and the, the fabric comes off. It's a real pain in the butt the first time you do it. Second time learning curves a little better. But the, the thing about the shade here is um, so many children um, are on medications nowadays where the sun's sensitive. And, um, you know, they'll put, parents will put cream and stuff like that on their kids. But um, the shade is a, a wonderful, wonderful addition that's integrated right into this. Yeah, we, we, we uh, focus, if you notice, on the RFQ. We, we made a point to talk about shading, shading, shading. Um, um, it's very sunny up there. Um, we're at our time limit, I believe, because yep. we have to be prepared for our next interview. Uh, so I want to, we could close this out. Um, John, we're going to um, wait for comments. We recorded this and we're going to um, let the public have a chance to look at it over the next week or two and get back to Mike McCarran and myself, uh, Mike McCarran and myself to uh, gather all the information together and help make a decision on who we're going to use. So we should know by the end of this month or beginning of June, uh, the developer on the design that we're going to choose for the project. Okay, doke. Sounds like a plan. I appreciate Great. the time and the option, the opportunity. That's for John Show. Great. Real Thank you so much. Real appreciate your time and your insight, John. You Thank got you, John. it. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye. Thanks.